Good afternoon. This is Across the Fence. I'm Jolie Whitney. University of Vermont Extension is looking at what Vermont's dairy industry might look like if it was dominated not by cattle, but by goats. At present, there is a small but viable goat industry in Vermont. The question for UVM researchers is how to increase viability, profitability, and find more markets for meat, milk, and value-added products. Across the Fence visits Ayersbrook Farm in Randolph. The farmers there are helping lead the charge to get more goats in the Green Mountains. Here's Keith Silva. It's milking time at Ayersbrook Goat Dairy in Randolph. Milking about 300 goats right now. It's a family farm. This farm is one of 20 goat dairies in Vermont, included in a study by the University of Vermont to find out about the viability, profitability, and sustainability of the goat dairy industry in the state. The research was commissioned by Vermont Creamery, Vermont's leading goat milk processor, with funding from the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center and conducted by UVM Extension and the UVM Center for Rural Studies. Kelsey Meehan, an Extension dairy specialist, is one of the researchers. It might sound cliche to say, but I think there's a mix of opportunities and challenges. Um, part of the research has been uh, interviews with 20 goat dairies across the state, so both um, dairies that are shipping to Vermont Creamery and, and farmstead creameries that are doing their own um, processing on farm. There is demand for fluid goat milk and for goat milk products, and then we're also hearing a lot of challenges, um, especially around milk price and profitability and, and working on ways to summarize that in the research and, and talk about best recommendations for, for the industry. The Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets estimates that there are a total of 30 goat farms in Vermont, which means in order to gain momentum, there needs to be more research and more events like this tour of Ayersbrook Goat Dairy. We're going to move them into that barn. Miles Hooper, one of the co-owners of the farm, speaks from experience when he talks about the importance of getting out and seeing how other farmers manage their operations. You can never go wrong by visiting as many farms as possible prior to making any kind of investment. We wish we had spent more time, particularly traveling in Europe, France and Netherlands, um, to gain uh, an understanding for how to efficiently set up a commercial dairy. The most meaningful experiences I've had um, in learning about goats and the industry and best practices um, have all come from visiting uh, other farms and particularly other farms in other countries. So two thirds of the herd is always milking. Hooper's travels in Europe speak to the lack of information and research regarding large scale goat dairies in the Northeast and the U.S. overall. Daryl Hooper seconds her husband's experience. There's a ton of information now about cows. You know, a lot of the information, if you go online about goats, is from a blog or from this, you know, Better Homes and Garden publication. Is there's not a lot of professional, there's not a lot of research right. out there. There's not a lot of commercial, yeah, there's not a lot of funding. So it's difficult in that way, you know, but uh, well, it's not discouraging. The research being done by UVM is the first step to create a baseline for the current state of goat dairies in Vermont and to take a long view of what Vermont's dairy industry would need if there's continued growth in the goat industry. We hear from farmers that more research is definitely needed on the herd health and veterinary and nutrition and reproduction side, genetics, and then even in the kind of research that we're doing, when we go to look at other studies, we find it's just not there on profitability and um, cost of production. These aren't boom times for Vermont's dairy farmers. And goat dairies are subject to the same market forces like inflation and the volatile costs of inputs that have been affecting cattle dairies for decades. Despite these circumstances, the refrain we heard over and over again on this tour was, goats aren't cows. When we started with the goats, we kind of thought of them as small cows. It took me many years to change my thinking about that. There are many similarities but there are some very important distinctions that if you just say, it, like when we're talking numbers, everything for a Holstein divided by 10, you know, there you have it for a goat, whether it's grain rations, volume of manure, volume of milk, so forth, it can be fraught thinking. And it's worth, it's worth doing 
Deborah Lee Adams runs Grand Deborah Farms in Castleton. She's been a longtime advocate of goat's milk products and has experienced the difference between milking cows and milking goats firsthand. Started with cows and I wouldn't go back to cows. I'll stick with my goats. <laughs> goats are a lot cleaner than cows. Um, the manure is different. Um, they're just easier to take care of. You don't need as big of a space as you do for cows. Adams is also familiar with the challenges of learning to take care of goats through trial and error. I think we've done everything wrong <laughs> before we figured out things that were right. Little by little you learn, you learn what works, and our basic philosophy is to keep it simple. I've done a couple of these farm tours to see what I can do for the future, improve our farm, what other things we can change. Brooklyn Courier is the assistant dairy manager at Blue Ledge Farm in Leicester. She echoed the importance of visiting other goat dairies to see how they operate. You can't just go drive down the road and see a goat dairy, it's pretty rare. It would be nice to have people come around and expand this. We could maybe get more research into this. Goat dairy farmers are connecting with each other because there's not as much research there. You know, they're calling each other, troubleshooting. Um, and one thing we heard was we would love to see other goat dairies, we'd love to have more of that connection, or I think it's really important for goat dairies who are starting up to see as many operations as they can, look at parlor setups, look at housing setups. Um, and so that was, that was partly my hope for these tours is that goat dairy farmers would be talking to each other. Making connections and maximizing efficiencies were the two takeaway messages from this tour. We do the best when we just stick to what we're good at while we like you know, crops and haying and so forth. Where we make our money is in the milking parlor. So optimizing genetics, herd comfort, and herd health. Those are the biggest levers for profitability that we could pull. We need to be making more milk. I don't know if we necessarily need to be milking more animals, but you know, the animals that you have need to be special and need to be productive and need to be healthy is basically, is basically the bottom line, yeah. And I think, don't underestimate the health of your animal. I know like when you're first starting out, like there's certain compromises you need to make and certain things you just like have to accept because you're trying to get started, but sourcing good animals is like really, I think, important. If the enthusiasm from the participants in this tour is any indication, then this won't be the last time farmers or Vermonters hear about goat dairies in Vermont. In Randolph, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thanks, Keith. It's time for a visit from Judy Miro, a resident houseplant hero. Today, she's got advice on how to care for the angel wing begonia. Take it away, Judy. Hi, I'm Judy Miro, an extension master gardener, coming to you from the University of Vermont greenhouse. I'm here to help you become a houseplant hero by providing some guidance on caring for your houseplants. Today, our focus is on the begonia maculata, better known as the angel wing begonia. This particular variety is the polka dot begonia. This sturdy upright stem plant prefers bright light to part shade, but no direct sun. It'll do swell in well-drained soils and can handle a monthly dose of fertilizer. This variety has gorgeous dark green leaves and it's covered in polka dots. If you notice the underside of these leaves is gorgeous it's got a beautiful maroon color. Oh, just love it. And just look, it's just like angel's wings. Just gorgeous. You'll be rewarded with clusters of flowers in the summer. If you don't cut this back, this begonia could actually grow four feet tall. You can easily cultivate it by stem cuttings and divisions. If you don't have a moisture meter, just water it when the top of the soil begins to dry out. Begonias can be the target of a number of pests, aphids, whiteflies, mealybugs, and scale. If you overwater, or as I like to say, over love your plants, you will invite one of these pests into your home. All of them will leave telltale signs that they've moved in. Make sure you are looking at the leaves and stems every time you water. If you notice anything suspicious, Pull the plant aside and do some additional monitoring. Look for webbing under the leaves. Uh, look for small white bumps on top of the stems or anything that's crawling on the plant. 
I use a small handheld lens uh, and a magnifying glass for just this purpose. What should you do if you find pests on your plant? Hose the plant off gently at the first sign of pests. Outside is best, but if it's less than 55 degrees, best to place the plant in the shower or the sink and give it a good rinse. Gently blast away any pests, and they might be hanging on, so that's a good thing to do. Remove any infected leaves or stems. Once your plant is drip dry while it's still in the sink or the shower, gently spray uh, some neem oil or horticultural oil to kill off any bugs that remain. And of course, always make sure you read the directions carefully and completely before applying any pest uh, application. And remember to wear all the required safety gear. To keep insects and fungus from attacking your houseplants, you'll need to maintain good air circulation and stop overwatering, or as I like to say, overloving your plants. Remember that by providing your plants with the conditions and care they need, you too can be a houseplant hero. For more information on houseplants or home gardens, visit the UVM Extension Master Gardener website and see our garden resources page or contact an Extension Master Gardener volunteer at the helpline. The phone number is on the screen. This is Extension Master Gardener Judy Miro wishing you happy growing. Thanks Judy. If you have any other houseplants in need of a hero, visit our YouTube channel by searching Across the Fence on YouTube. Thanks to everyone here at WCAX for making today's program possible. I'm Jolay Whitney, have a good one.